looking at one. You're looking at one. You're looking at one. You have no idea what God has brought me out of. You can't even tell when you look at me. I've been in a season of... This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I'm Dr. Bernard Grant, pastor of Showers of Blessing Christian Center right here in the city of Rocky Mount, North Carolina. What an awesome privilege, a precious privilege it is to be able to minister to you today the word of the living God. I believe with all of my heart we are in um, some unusual times, but I believe for the body of Christ it is our time to shine. Uh, as you come on, I want you to like, I want you to share, because as I so often say, one of the best things you could do for anybody is give them the word of God because it is the incorruptible seed. It is the incorruptible seed. And as you're coming on, um, let me just talk with you a moment and we'll get into the lesson that I want to minister to you on today. I know it'll be a real blessing to you and yours. So again, I want you to like, I want you to share with as many people as possible. Um, if you're unmarried, we understand that whether you're married, you're single, or you're a man or woman of God today, um, this is a little different. But we know that God is sovereign, and we, we trust him, and uh, we thank God for him. Now, uh, if I was saying to a, a single the other day that you may be alone, but you're not lonely. Remember that. In fact, I did a message recently uh, to all of our unmarried people that you're alone, but you're not lonely. It, you know, it's good to be alone. And this is, sometimes God has to give you the gift and you have to embrace the gift of slowing down. And uh, so you may be alone, but you're not lonely, if you, even if you're unmarried. Loneliness and it, is not being alone. Uh, being alone is good. That's geographical. That's a wonderful thing. Exodus 3, Exodus 3, 3 says that God wouldn't speak until Moses got alone. John got the book of Revelation alone on the Isle of Patmos. Paul spent three years alone. Moses got the Ten Commandments up in a mountain with God alone. So we know that there is that being alone, some alone time, is a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. And so uh, take advantage of this time. Nothing wrong with being alone. But loneliness is not the will of God for any of us. And you need to understand as a believer and as a Christian, although you may be alone, again, you're not, you're not lonely. And for, if you're unmarried for such a time as this, I want you to enjoy this season of singleness. And uh, they, there's, many have coined this term. It's kind of new to us uh, called social distancing. Really, it's not social distancing, it's physical touching is what um, they don't want you to do and that, that we should not be doing at this time. But you know, if you're unmarried, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1 tells all unmarried folk, uh, don't touch. If you're going to date, date non-sexually. I'm talking to the singles for a moment. Um, 1 Corinthians 7, 1 says, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. It's good for a man not to touch. So uh, that's important during this time, right? Okay, uh, because the enemy wants to keep you single and sad and married and mad. Uh, and, and we have a real challenge in our culture today. I heard an alarming statistic that 7.5 million couples are living together unmarried. And 95% of new brides are not virgins. So now we have a challenge here. And, and, and we're, talking about some, we're talking about Christians. And so we have to make this commitment to not touch. Don't touch. 1 Corinthians 7 and 1. That's what the Apostle Paul said. Amen. Then as a married couple, make sure you stay out of strife during this season. You know, because you can't escape and go to work and go nowhere. <laughs> and you don't want to get out of love because faith works by love. So make sure that you, you know, keep your prayer life intact. Make sure y'all keep the strife out the house, the arguing, the bickering, the fussing, and all that kind of stuff. Amen. And then as pastors and leaders, 
let's remind ourselves that the anointing is on the pastor and not the building. The anointing. There's a deposit in you. You can't get nowhere. The anointing is not on the building. The anointing is on the man or woman of God. And what a time that we have. Take advantage of this time. Take advantage of our advantage to refresh ourselves because you can't feed unless you read. Uh, you got to stop a lot of texting and start studying the text. And uh, remember now, at this time, it's, it's, you get full up because... You can't build your ministry on just spiritual gifts. And so we understand that. And then I believe it's critical and uh, that we get, that we and I, you and I as believers, that we return to God. The Bible talks about his people returning to him, implying that they got away. Uh, Job chapter 22, verses 21 through 20, 20, 23. In fact, Job 22, 23 talks about how we need to get reacquainted with God and we need to go back. We need to return back to God. Malachi 3.7 tells us how to return. There's basically two primary ways that you and I can return back to God. Number one is through praise and worship. Yes, through praise and worship. Get the idols out of your life. Get the idolatry out of your life. Whatever you have put before God, career, job, money, cash, cribs, cars, clothes, ministry, whatever you have made an idol of, kill the idols, get the idols out of your life, return to God through praise and worship unto God. The second way Malachi says that you return to God, of course, is through your tithes and your offerings. That's what Malachi 3, 7 says. That's how you, they've gotten away from God's order. They've gotten away from God. And what an awesome thing privilege you have now to return back to God, to return back to God. Let's get into the lesson today. Let's get into the lesson today. Today we want to deal with, and I believe this is really apropos to where we're at now in our country, in our lives. Listen to me. I want to minister from the subject exposing and eliminating fear, exposing and eliminating fear. And what I want you to be able to do is recognize and overcome or eliminate this vicious, unseen enemy called fear. In this season, we cannot allow that foul, demonic spirit of fear to take over in our lives. And so when we look at it, and we're going to have to, as we get into this, we're going to have to understand that it's possible to know God's word and yet choose fear in the storm of life or in a crisis. As believers, you don't have the luxury or the option of choosing fear. You got to stay in faith. And we know that faith and fear are mutually exclusive. What do you mean mutually exclusive, Dr. Grant? That, I, that mean, I mean that we cannot walk in faith and fear at the same time. Just like you can't worry and trust God at the same time. It's either or. And we know trust requires unanswered questions. Faith and fear are mutually exclusive. Right now, right now, you're either in faith or you're in fear. Those are the two powerful but different spiritual forces that's in the world today. You and I as believers must expose because fear, we're going to see, it can disguise itself. It can cloak itself behind worry, procrastination. We'll get into it, etc., cetera, et cetera. Sometime we think we're in faith, but we're not. And God is a faith God. Yes, he is. He's a, the Bible says in Matthew 9, be it unto you according to your faith. All right? God is 
of faith God. He desires, he expects uh, his people to operate by faith. For for the Bible said for us Christians, we walk by you know, by faith and not by the senses or by sight. So what is fear? Three questions. Three questions I want to address today. And uh, if we don't get into get it all, we'll just continue. But three que three questions that we want to address today. Number one, the first question is, I'll give you the overview and we'll deal with each one of them. Number one, what is fear? Okay, okay, we're hearing this word fear being thrown around, but what is fear? We're going to answer that. Second question we want to address today is, what are people afraid of? Especially during this time. And then we're going to deal with What's wrong with fear? Oh my goodness. What, what, ooh, what's wrong with it? It, it, it? Dr. Grant, is a little bit of fear okay? No, 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 no. I'm going to show you what's wrong with it. But let's deal with the first one. The first question is, what is fear? Fear is simply, watch this, is simply a feeling of anxiety or panic. That's all it is. It's a feeling of anxiety or panic. You can write that down. In fact, I trust that you following me along with, in your Bible, taking some notes, making mental notes. Listen to me. What is fear? It's a feeling of, it's a feeling of anxiety and panic caused by an awareness of danger or perceived danger. It, it's this anxiety. And you know, people sometimes, People have anxiety attacks. I mean, literally. And, they, and what is anxiety? It's worry. And we know worry, worry is a sin. Many people don't think it's a sin, but worry, worry is a sin. And and uh, most Christians commit this. One. Talking about the sin of worry. Worry is a grave digger with no sympathy. Worry is like sitting in a rocking chair. You're moving, but you're not making any progress. We're not built for worry. Another word for word, stress. It will kill you. Fear is a feeling of anxiety. Anxiety is worry, is nervousness. Watch this. Locate yourself and so God can help. It, it, it is a feeling of, of anxiety. Anxiety, what is it? Anxiety is worry, nervousness, and uneasiness about an imminent event. What is panic? Panic, it means to act without thinking. Basically, you're having a meltdown. You're totally freaking out. That's, that's, that's what's behind uh, the panic buying, people making a run on stuff, people fighting <laughs> in stores, stealing stuff in other folk carts at the grocery store, uh, stealing toilet paper from public restrooms. I mean, this is panic. I mean, I mean, look, <laughs> people buying guns, people hoarding. Uh, all of this stuff is simply a result of panicking. As believers, we don't panic, we pray. But, but it's real. We're not in denial. So now, another definition of fear. What is fear? Fear is a negative expectation or outlook. Now listen to me. Listen. What are you expecting right now? What is your outlook on life? Are you expecting to lose money? To lose your job? Uh, because what you expect you will experience eventually. Are you expecting to lose your life or the life of a loved one? I don't know about you, but I'm expecting, boy, when all the when the dust settles, all this is all, I'm expecting new growth. New anointing, fresh oil, fresh power. I'm, I think God, this thing going to explode. God, something's about to happen. There was a, uh, a, a Baptist preacher, uh, Leo Daniels, preached a message one time he, entitled, What in Hell Do You Want? You know, uh, we have to understand the times that we live in. And there's a real Heaven to gain 
and a real hell to shun. And we as believers got the answer. In his name is Jesus. Oh my goodness. So we've answered the question, what is fear? The second question is what are people afraid of? What are people afraid of? Relative to this season and this time that we're living in. There are four basic things that got some folk up at night, pulling their hair out and biting their nails, upset stomach, stressed out, four basic things. And we're not in the now. What I'm saying to you, these four basic things is real. Don't be judgmental. People dealing with stuff. Four basic things. Number one, there is they are afraid of the unknown. That's part of what drives the anxiety. Unknown. The unknown. What do you mean? The unknown. A lack of information. Without information, people just fill in the gaps, start imagining the worst. There's a lack of knowledge about this virus itself. There's a lack of knowledge about those who are affected. There's a lack of knowledge about the pervasiveness and the severity of the virus in America. People talk about, you know, they need more testing. There's an there's a unknown element on how long this will last. Nobody's quite certain. You know, they try to put, you know, 15 days, four months. Oh, people are not. They don't know. So there's a fear of the unknown. We as believers know that trusting God requires unanswered questions that you have to learn to trust God at the not knowing level, trembling, but trusting. The second thing that people are afraid of is the fear of inadequacy Inad inadequacy of the preventive me me measures. In other words, am I, am I doing enough? You wash your hands, but is that, are you doing enough with that? You know, you don't touch your face, no hugs, no kisses, no handshakes, but is that enough? The inadequacy of preparedness. Is our government really prepared? Are there enough face masks, ventilators? Am I really prepared? These are questions we're asking. People are asking, what are people afraid of? The inadequacy. Do I have an, an, the inadequacy of preparedness? Am I prepared? I got Okay, you got a two-week supply of food and medicine, but do I have enough groceries to last? And then the third one, and I'm going to deal with this for a moment. And that's the fear of shortage. I'm answering the question now. We answered the question, what is fear? Now we're answering the question, what, the second question is, what are people afraid of? People are afraid, they, they fear, they're afraid of the unknown. There is the fear, secondly, of inadequacy. And thirdly, there is the fear of shortage. The fear of shortage. Now we're dealing with this money issue, okay? Satan, relative to believers, Satan ultimately wants to cut off the supply line so the troops won't have what they need to win the war. And so there is this fear of shortage. We're talking materially and financially now. Listen to me. A recent USA Today poll found that Americans are more worried about finances than their own health. Now, they're worried about their health. They're concerned, I should say, about their health. But they're more concerned, this is what the poll said, in the wealthiest nation in the world, more Americans are worried about their finances than their own health. They're more concerned about the economy Listen, the stock market, are you? Their paychecks, will they be able to make it? If they have a small business, how long can we hold out? Now, again, and it's going to get real in a moment as we approach the first of the month. Because mo for most people, to be most people, the only thing that's changed right now is their social life. Their money ain't changed right now. Not yet, but it is. Things are going to be real. And people, are, people there is this fear of, of shortage. People are concerned. So that some people are hoarding 
because of this fear of shortage. There, there's a fear uh, of their own personal financial stability, a possible job loss, possibly a plant shutting down or, or the small business shutting down. And people have a fear of shortage. But let me talk to you today and I and I, I, I listen to me. What I'm about to share with you, I believe, will see you through any financial difficulties and challenges in your life. Okay? So follow me closely. Follow me closely because God, I found out that God is such a loving God. God is concerned about what you're concerned about. In other words, he's concerned. He, he knows what you have need of. And he's your daddy. And God will never be guilty of non-support. So he has a word for you. And, 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 and I, I'm, I'm going to spend the rest of my time here today. We'll get into what's wrong with fear. How that Satan uses fear to torment a person's mind. That fear is the material that Satan uses to create an explosive device to destroy your life. We're going to deal with that because Job said it himself. Job said, Job 325, the thing which I greatly feared is come upon me. Whew. Fear gives Satan the opportunity to come into your life and turn you into a negative magnet. Things that you don't want to happen. Things that you don't desire to happen. Fear will bring that stuff in your life. That's how deadly that demonic spirit is. 2 Timothy 1.7 says that fear does not come from God, so it's not okay. It's not okay. Fear give, faith, faith gives substance to things hoped for. Fear gives substance to things not hoped for. And listen at this statement. Satan needs fear to operate in the earth just like God needs faith to operate in the earth. Job's fear gave Satan the material to blow up his life. And the devil wants to blow your life. He wants to wreck your life. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And the Bible, that's why the Bible said, give, don't give him place. Don't give him access. Fear gives the enemy, the devil, your adversary, access into your life to steal, kill, and destroy. God expects believers to resist fear and to choose faith. So now let's go back and deal with this fear of shortage and then we'll get into the fear of death next time because most folk listen they don't fear flying they fear dying all fear is rooted in the fear of death <laughs> yeah the fear of becoming sick with the virus the fear of, of uh, your loved ones or significant other con contracting a deadly disease fear of death I'll deal with that I I'm gonna show you how to eliminate that all together out of your life if you're a Christian, nobody can threaten you with death. My God, absent from the body, present with the Lord. I'll show you how to deal with that. But let's go back and stick a pin in this area of the fear of shortage. Remember now, we said, what are people afraid of? They're, they're afraid. There's the fear of the unknown, the fear of inadequacy. Watch this. Thirdly, the fear of shortage. And fourth of all, the fear of death. Let's stick a pin in this area of the fear of of shortage. Let's go now to 1 Kings chapter 17. Now follow me closely. 1 Kings chapter 17. Because fear is a tactic and strategy of the enemy to hinder you from moving forward. To hinder you from moving forward. 1 Kings chapter 17. You know, the devil don't have any new tricks. Okay? Don't have any new tricks. He's not a He's not an originator. He's a copycat. And the same stuff he's been using over the years, all the way back to the Garden of Eden, he's still using the same strategy. And fear is one of those strategies. Boy, I'm telling you. And when you get into the fear of shortage, the fear of shortage, it will cripple you. It'll cause you, relative to the word of God, to choke and not move forward. And that's what the enemy wants to do. That's what the enemy wants to do. First Kings chapter 17. I, 
I, I want you to read this in your devotional time. Many of you are familiar with this text, 1 Kings chapter 17. There was a three and a half year drought in the land because there, there, there had been no rain. There had been no rain. So that's drought, which comes, which causes famine because this was an agricultural society. So we see here in 1 Kings 17, 1, and Elijah, the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead, listen to me now, said to Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain drought these years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, get away from here, turn eastward, got to follow the instructions, and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan, and it will be that you shall drink from the brook. I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. That's supernatural provision. Verse number five. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. For he went and stayed by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up. He didn't do nothing wrong. Challenge of the time. Brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. We're not in heaven yet. Whatever impacts the, the, the society, it impacts us too. But watch this. <laughs> we got supernatural help. Look at verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belonged to Zidon, and dwell there. See, I've commanded a widow woman there to provide for you. So being in your set place under the right pastor, that's who God, Jeremiah 315, the pastor that God has chosen for you to be under is critical. He says there. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and said, please bring me a little water in the cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So she said, and the Lord your God, as the Lord your God lives, do I do not. She said, I do not have. I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin, and a little oil in a jar. And see, I've gathered a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Her plan was eat and die. So technically, she's on death row. You're going to eat the last meal and die. But God's got a better plan. Verse 13. And Elijah said to her, watch this. Elijah said to her, verse 13, do not fear. I'm saying to you right now, do not fear. Don't fear lack. Don't fear scarcity. The man of God was living a supernatural life. And this woman is going to plug in to this supernatural life that this man of God is living. She's going to start living supernaturally. Watch this. And Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first. First. And bring it to me. And afterward, make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the job all run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. And she went, she obeyed. She went away and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and he and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake or spoke by Elijah. Woo. We see here, this woman, literally on death row, had already been instructed by God what to do. She knew what to do. But fear gripped her. And it could be gripping you right now. She was about to choke. And the man of God, thank God for a man of God. Thank God for a man or woman of God. Thank God for preachers who will just preach the unadulterated 
not watered down, not sugar-coated version of this Bible that will take the criticism or whatever and minister to the people of God to tell them what thus saith the Lord, to tell them God's way. Amen. Amen. Listen at this. You will miss your miracle moment because you're consumed with fear and you're not focusing on God's ability to see you through. In this season, don't scale back. Don't draw back. Don't cut back on God. Don't back off what you believe. Don't stop tithing. Don't stop giving. Don't stop obeying God. Do what you know. It takes faith to obey God when it doesn't make sense. Now listen, you can't buy the favor of God. Faith is not faith. Listen, faith is not the price that buys the blessings of God, but it is the hand that reaches out to receive the blessings of God. In verse 9, God had already spoken. Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Zidon, and dwell there. See, I have already, I've commanded a widow woman there to provide for you. God, listen to me. God is talking to somebody about you right now. <laughs> He's already spoke to the blessing. He already spoke to the blessing. He's waiting on your obedience. And we got to learn to obey God in difficult times. This was challenging for her. There was no surplus. She had no leftover money. You're talking about payday to payday. This woman was in dire need. And wouldn't it be like God? Both of them had to trust God. Both of them had to hear from God. That, that's why hey, this ain't no game. God spoke to her and God spoke to him. He had to trust God. Because, you know, in the natural, wait a minute, God, why are you sending me to a poor widow? Couldn't you send me to somebody else? God sends the man of God to a poor widow. Now, God, I, I ain't trying to ask no poor widow for nothing. Because, you know, the news get a hold of this thing. And come on now, they already persecute me about this and that. And now you're going to take me to go to a poor widow and ask her to make it, to get me some first? Now, come on, God. <laughs> And then she going to have to trust God. He already spoke to her. But listen to me. God is waiting on your obedience. God's got to talk. When it comes to some people, God will meet you at the, listen, God's got to talk to your husband and children. You can't change them. God meets you at the point of your obedience. It'll work if you work it. Now, listen at this. In St. John chapter 6, verses 1 through 14, I want you to read that. There is a demand for which there is no apparent supply. A two-piece fish dinner Jesus takes in St. John 6, one of the greatest miracles in the Bible. A two-piece fish dinner, a little lad's lunch, and feeds 5,000 men besides women and children. Now, This woman, when she, I know she asked, how are we going to make it? If I do this, wait a minute. She had two primary things going for her and the same thing you got going for you. Because God is no respect of person. Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. Yesterday and forever. This woman, in verse 13 and 14, guess what she had? She had a word from God. She had a word from God. One word from God will change your life. This woman had a word from God in her dire need. I mean, you talking about the, you talking about fear of shortage? Listen, she said her plan was simple: we're gonna eat it and die. God's plan was sow it and live. She had a word from God, and then verse fifteen lets us know she had a willingness to obey. You talking about some precious seed? Some precious seed. 
if you continually act out on God's word in the crisis, in this season, this, these times will be the greatest times of your life. She had a will, she had a willingness to obey. The Bible said, verse 6, so she went away and did according to the word of Elijah. She did it. She did it. Trembling but trusting. And I'm telling you right now, obedience will always require the sowing of a significant seed. This woman began to live as the man of God lived supernaturally. Don't mess up your future season. Don't draw back. Don't choke. Because I found out a long time ago that tithes and offerings is how you make a deposit into your heavenly bank account. Don't choke. What is choking? Choking is a deliberating moment in time when you are considering doing wrong for you unmarried folk, you either single and satisfied or you're single and sinning. You're considering doing wrong you, uh, you, it's a deliberating moment of time when you're uh, compromising, considering compromise, considering doing something other than the will of God, considering doing something other than what God told you to do, or you're considering doing something you said you would never do. Woo. Listen at this. My giving supports the kingdom of God because the gospel is free, but the pipeline costs a lot of money. 2 Kings 12, 4 says money comes to me to bring to the house of God. Yeah, money cometh to me, but it comes to me, 2 Kings 12, 4, to bring to the house of God. The Bible lets us know, watch this, the Bible lets us know that my quality of life is connected to my, to my giving. That's 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8. Through 10. Giving is a whole lot bigger than meeting a budget or paying bills at the church. My offerings releases the grace of God in all areas of my life, not just the money area, but it helps me in my relationships, my career, my health, my peace in every area of my life. Listen to me. This woman made it through the crisis because she obeyed the man of God. Proverbs 11, verse 24 through 25. Genesis 26 talks about Isaac sowing in a time of famine. Anything God tells you to do, he also gives you the grace to do it. Don't vote on what God said. Do it. He is God. He is God. And God requires us to fund his good works in the earth. That's 2 Kings 9, 8, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 18. This fear of shortage can grip you if you don't stay focused on the word of God. Now listen to me carefully. During this season, I believe, and this is what the Lord said, for, for me to tell you, there's money in your mouth. You're going to have to guard what you're saying. Don't quote the news. Let's quote the word. The word says, I go from increase to increase. So I'm saying the Lord is increasing me more and more, me and my children. That's Psalm 115, verse 14. There's money in your mouth. I say what the word says. Wealth and riches are in my house. We got to feed your faith and starve your doubts to death. I believe your homework. This is your homework. Since you're home, here's your homework. There are three subjects I want you to meditate on during this season. Meditate on faith. Meditate on healing, which we're going to deal with Tuesday. And meditate on finances. What the word of God has to say about it. Confidence is based on what you know. Confidence is... It's based on what you know. The reason I'm not nervous, the reason I'm not, listen to me, the reason that I'm excited about what God is doing and what God is up to is because I, of what I know. What I know about God. And I've seen him do it over and over again. Don't you choke in this season. 
And nobody, nobody's exempt from the, from the uh, temptation of choking. Even Jesus. Yeah, even Jesus. You read it. Matthew chapter 26, verse 39. Matthew 26, 39. Even Jesus had, to, had his choking moment. He had to get past it. He had to say, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Amen. This is the season where you stick with the word of God and God will see you through big time. Let me pray with you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for my brother and I thank you for my sister. Thank you for this time together around your word. I rebuke the spirit of fear. The fear of the unknown, the fear of inadequacy, the fear of shortage and the fear of death. I come against it now in the name of Jesus. And I thank you, Lord God, that although we may feel fear, we won't act on it. We'll continue to act and they will continue to act out on your word in Jesus name. And so this Sunday, I want to give you an opportunity to sow good seed in the good ground. There's only two ways to give to God. There's only two ways. And that's through anointed men and ministries. This ministry is good, good ground. We have, we, we're not new to this, we're true to this. We have a proven track record of excellence. And I believe that by you sowing into this ground, you'll never go wrong. I, I'm just telling you. Uh, there are five ways that you can give to us uh, today to give to this ministry. And, uh, of course, we have a cash app. Uh, somebody type that in if it's not already. We have a cash app. The dollar sign, showers of blessing. Of course, you can mail your, your, your money in. 1740 East Raleigh Boulevard, Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, 27801. Or you can use the P.O. Box. We got a P.O. Box, P.O. Box 2916, Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, 27802. So you can mail it in. Or you could go to Secure Gear. You could also go to our website, showersofblessing.org. Or for those of you locally or in the area, whether you're in Field Tar uh, Tarbor, wherever you're at, Raleigh, I don't know where you're at, where you, you can come by the church at 1740 and we have a drop box on the admin side. And you can just drive through. Get out the car, drop it in, and keep moving. So those basically during this season is the five ways that you can give. Again, cash app, mail, secure gear, our website, or our drop box where you drive through and drop your seed in the ground. And for you members, of course, we have a very mature church, spiritually mature. You you know, just because you don't show up in the building, you that, that don't exempt you from, from time uh, and giving. So we bring our tithes and offerings. And so these are the ways that you can do it during this season. Look, stay with the word. Stay out of fear. Be encouraged. Know that Pastor Dr. Bernard Grant is praying for you. I'm praying for you. Uh, I, 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 we're, we're praying for all those in authority. We're believing God that this is the time. I believe with all of my heart. This is what the Bible says, that it calls it the evil day. This is the time where you act out on what you believe. We don't back off from what we believe, but we do the word. Watch this, even in difficult times, and God will give us the grace, the ability to continue and to move forward. We're gonna be, we're gonna, we're gonna show the world. Listen, we're the salt of the earth, we're the light of the world, we're the leaders, we're gonna have poise, we're going to have confidence. We're not going to freak out during this season. We're going to see the hand of God in a greater way. And I promise you, listen to me, you stay with the word. When the dust settles, you're going to be better, stronger. Any losses, God's going to compensate you for it. He's going to restore all. You go, Listen to me, you will recover all. And how your story ends, God never ends on a negative. He always ends on a positive. And Jesus is coming back for a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. I'm glad. I'm glad to be in the number. I'm so glad. Listen to me. I, I, I text one pastor and, and told another that, look, you were born for this, for such a time as this. Amen. God has equipped you. You're ready. You got what it takes. It's in you. 
Now let's go forth. Let's stick with the word. Let's stay together and continue to act out on the word of the living God. Love you. God bless you. We'll see you next time.